Hello, I'm Steph from iDriver Classic and today I'm showing you one of the most iconic British vehicles ever made. It's the Series 1 Land Rover. This particular example is from 1955 and Land Rovers are funny because when you show them to people, I feel like they're in the most natural state when they're not quite concourse and they're a little bit pre-loved as this one is here today. It's got a fantastic story. We're gonna do an epic test drive in it like we've never done before. And we're gonna show you all around it. It's had a few modifications throughout her life. We'll talk to you a little bit about those as well. But first of all, let's kick off with a walk around the vehicle and I'll talk to you about the Series 1 Land Rover. 1948 was a really exciting year for automotive and many cars that we now consider real classics in game changers like the 2CV, the Morris Minor, the Jaguar XK20 and the Porsche 356 all launched at motor shows across the world. But perhaps one of the most important vehicles to come to market in 1948 was the Series 1 Land Rover. However, it wasn't all plain sailing in the world of automotive in the 1940s and 50s, which is where this comes in and I think I need to give you a bit of context. So before the First World War, Rover had been an independent manufacturer based in Coventry and they made vehicles aimed at the middle and upper classes. The pre-war Rover that we did last year really shows this off perfectly. Now during the war, many big manufacturers were forced to give up factories for war effort and Rover was not immune to this. And in addition to this, a shadow factory was established by the brand in Solihull, which for those of you watching from abroad, it's around 14 miles away from Coventry. Now also if you're based abroad you may not know this, that Coventry was one of the most badly hit cities not only in the UK but in the world during the war and that was largely due to it being the hub of the manufacturing world of the UK and in 1940 alone there were 198 tonnes of bombs which fell onto the city and one of these attacks destroyed the Rover factory and that then meant that all the production moved over to Solihull. So in Solihull before that they'd been mainly making planes. Now cut to the end of the war, Rover's in a very different place to where it was in 1939. The old models that they'd been producing were outdated and raw materials are in very thin supply. The company decide it's time to do things differently because they need to keep going, it's sink or swim. Rover's managing director decided to create a stopgap vehicle which would give the company time to design new cars and for steel supply chain to improve. The metal of choice was something called Bermabrite. May not surprise you to know it was made in Birmingham and it was an al aluminium alloy or aluminium if you're watching from America which could be easily sourced. The inspiration for the series was taken from wartime jeeps and the idea was to create a vehicle which was part way between a light truck and a tractor. The, bro the brother of Rover's chief designer had been using an army surplus jeep on his farm in North Wales. And it was this which gave them the idea for a vehicle which would take the place of that stop gap vehicle. It had to be suitable for agricultural use, incorporate a power takeoff or a PTO if you're into agriculture, and it had to be simple to create, things that you could create on a jig. And that's how those simple flat panels as we see here today came into play. Now the vehicle we see here today takes inspiration from that early prototype and it's not all that far removed. Although that central early steering position has been moved to the driving position we see today and is more in keeping with what we drive in our modern cars, but there's a reason for it. So the reason was, was they moved it out of the center because they noticed that when the canvas top was up, driver's hand signals couldn't be seen. This also meant that a passenger seat could be added in and other bits and pieces, including the 80 inch ladder chassis, which was apparently easier to make. It was dubbed the go anywhere vehicle in early marketing literature and it debuted at the 1948 Amsterdam Motor Show. It was only available at first as a two-door ragtop painted in green and priced at £450. Well, I say it was two-door, but guess what? The doors and the canvas roof were both optional extras. If you're wondering how they got away with pricing it so cheaply, they classified the vehicle as a commercial rather than a standard private car. Now, this was to circumvent the taxis levied on cars at the time. The initial setup was simple. It had the 1.6 litre petrol engine as used in the pre-war Rovers, giving around 50 brake horsepower. And it was fitted with the Rover P3 
four speed transmission unit and that was coupled with a new two speed transfer box which of course set it up for the four wheel drive. In 1952 the larger two litre petrol engine was fitted. I don't expect to see those coil springs as they used on some of the later stuff either because they weren't introduced until 1983. These were fitted with semi-elliptical leaf springs and that was typical for commercials of the era. This particular example we're testing here today has been slightly modified which may not surprise you and you may have already spotted. We've got the sound deadening in the engine bay, a 2 litre inlet over exhaust engine with alloy cylinder head, it's been pinched from a rotted out P4, hence that badging to the front and a few other bits like the SU carb instead of the standard Solex and a different distributor. There's also other touches of modern living like the defender mirrors, the different wheels and the Ramsey winch. Now this is a very basic potted history and there is so much more reading to be had out there if this is an area of interest for you but for now let me give you a tour of the dash before we go out adventuring. Now coming inside this Series 1 Land Rover is just as exciting as the Humber for last, from last week because driving this is very different to driving anything else that I've driven. I mean for goodness sakes we've got four-wheel drive, it's a very agricultural experience and it it's something which I've wanted to do for a while and it's so exciting to take you out today. Now the first things first, the demographic for these was always going to be an agricultural farmer market. That's what it was back then and although the demographic has changed nowadays, it's very much a status symbol to have a Land Rover badge on your bonnet. These were essentially farm vehicles to be used alongside tractors, that's why they had things like PTOs. So when we came inside, and it's always a criticism that I have for vehicles that I'm testing, that they don't have glove boxes, I completely understand why this one just has this empty space. But look, there's plenty of room there, and there's even room in front of us, because uh, you're going to be needing some spanners, so um, let's have lots of space to put them in. Now I'm going to point to this one just because it's the one in front of me but it's exactly the same on the passenger side, it is the windscreen wiper. Now these don't operate like your normal windscreen wipers because first of all they operate independently so if you've got this one on you don't have to have the passenger and vice versa. Now the way that we do it is you're going to see that up close as well, we place this windscreen wiper onto the screen so I've lifted that arm there and then we twist this here. Might help if I put the ignition on. And you'll see there that that starts the windscreen wiper. Now to turn it off, we put that switch back down and we lift that arm and place it down and that is your windscreen wipers off. Interesting bit of tech and I thought I'd show you that there as well. Now coming into the centre of the dash is all very simple because remember this is an agricultural vehicle. It was designed in the late 1940s. It isn't some massively specced up beast and it doesn't need to be because this isn't where the magic is with a Land Rover. So you've got two main dials here. So the one on the left there, you've got your amp meter and your fuel gauge and just a little warning there for your main beam. You've got these two sockets here that you can plug in. We talked about those on the standard cars, they had those on as well. And you've got two warning lights there. Now one is for ignition and one is oil warning light. Now coming over on the right hand side here you've got your speedo. Now coming across these are three panels which you may not have seen on a normal series one and that's because they've been retrofitted. Remember this vehicle is from 1955 so not everything is going to be as is because it's a used vehicle, it's used most days and it's nice to see actually. So over here we've got your indicators and this is just a standard old Bakelite switch. Now if you remember when we tested that A35 it had exactly the same switch in it and I believe it's in a few of the other older vehicles that we've tested from the 30s and 40s. Coming over to the right hand side here this is something that I would say people really should consider fitting to a classic or vintage vehicle where it doesn't impede the looks, it is hazard lights because no matter what you do there will always be people that don't see you or that just, they are invaluable to add in. Above that is a switch that does absolutely nothing and coming over to the right hand side there, this is a Red X car care. Now this is a little bit different from anything we've seen before. So essentially it's almost saying to you, what so it's, it's measuring vacuum but if you keep it within the green area that's like I'm saying well you know you're doing 
you're doing your best at fuel economising. But I mean, look, today's test drive is not going to be about fuel economisation. But you'll see when we get there, because this is going to be a test drive for the difference. Let's talk about where the fuel cap is. Because I imagine that you were watching this and you were looking around and you thought, so where do you put the fuel in? Well, guess what? It's under my seat, which I don't fancy my chances if anything goes wrong, but that is under there. I don't think you would ever do that nowadays. That's scary. And it's a four speed box as you would expect. And then you've just got a couple of bits down here. So it's push start as per all older vehicles. And you've got a choke there as well. So yes, we've got these yellow and red. I don't know how to describe them. They look like giant lollipops. Anyway, let me show you how it works. So to pop it into fourth gear, fourth gear, to pop it into four wheel drive, we push this down. And then for your high range and your low range, you move through this red one. So when you watch this, so if you watch this as it comes forward, that yellow one should pop up. It seems to happen sometimes, but not every time. Hold on. There we go. And we're going to try and demonstrate that on today's test drive. It can be sometimes a little bit tricky when we're trying to show things down here, but there's nothing quite like a practical road test. So let's get the Land Rover started up and you can hear what she sounds like. Needless to say, this won't be the quietest cabin test that we've ever had, but I think it's going to be the most exciting. But before we go out on the test drive of a lifetime, let's go to the back of the car and I'll let you have a listen from the outside. We're doing it differently today, aren't we, on the test drive? Instead of the usual where we go out for a drive through boring mundane roads, we've had a suggestion, haven't we? What's your suggestion, Chris? Well, a bit of gentle off-roading through the uh, you know, Southern Lake District. Okay, let's go and use this car for what it's intended for. But first, I need to put on the GoPro because I'm going to show you some of the outside shots as well as this. But I mean, it is raining, so it might be a bit rainy, but let's crack on. I'm a bit nervous, you know. Oh, you don't need to be. Have you done a lot of this before? Not, not a lot, no, but this is a, just a nice gentle introduction. This is not like <laughs> mud plugging or anything. No. Are we going down, that way? Left? Down the way. No, no, I've said that. No. Ooh. Oh, I don't know. Carry on. Okay, we'll see what Carry happens. On. Now, I think the first thing that's really struck me about driving this is a lot of people have said that it's really hard to change gears or they feel so heavy and it just takes away the joy of driving but actually this isn't too bad even on this mad adventure that we're going on so one thing is i've got fairly narrow tires yeah they haven't got a wide contact patch so they are, the steering, yeah, if, you put, yeah. Yeah, if you put radial tires on yeah. it could be a lot more grippy and a lot more force through the wheel right well anyway, for all those naysayers at home that have told me that Land Rovers are awful to drive, I actually think it's good fun. Quite noisy. Well, it's a farm vehicle, I'd expect it to be noisy and I'm absolutely fine about it actually. And I think one of the other things for people at home is that it's a very different shape to what I'm used to driving. And spatial awareness of this vehicle has come so easy to me because it's essentially just a giant box. Ooh. It's essentially just a giant box with wheels and um, <laughs> it's okay. And you know what? To say that these cars were designed in 1948, it is incredible. It must have really changed everybody's life. I mean, people must have been so reliant on tractors and then they would have got a Land Rover and it would have just changed the game completely. Yeah, and if you couldn't afford both, you could really use your, la your Land Rover as a substitute tractor. Yeah. So you could use a PTO on the back for uh, you know, cutting wood or yeah. pulling fire machinery. But then also you could tow a trailer to market with, with your products on. It really is a vehicle which does it all. It's brilliant. 
Now I'm going to have to be extra cheeky. Will you pop out and uh, open the gate for I'll, us? I'll be gate boy. I don't mind. Thank you. <laughs> this is very good fun. Now I've been one of those people that have always thought that Land Rovers were a bit over height. And you know people had almost glamorised them. You know what people do with MGBs, E-type Jags and even Minis where they go, oh yeah, it's supposed to be a clever. But driving this, and I'm just going to watch out because you might be able to see on the camera, but we've got a bit of a sheer drop. So I'm going to be going into this fern slightly. Now one thing that I will say is I have cleared with Chris that I can be going into some of this shrubland if needs be. So it's a funny one really because today's test drive feels more like an experience rather than a test drive. But it's so good to finally take a vehicle out and do what it's supposed to do. Now with this hill, I need to drop okay, down into first, down don't into I? First, yeah. Just yeah. to control your speed. So I'm going to drop into first. So, I'm yeah, to you're just using engine braking yeah. rather than braking with, the, with the, uh, the foot brake. This is very good fun. Now this is more like a normal driving experience. I mean, the Humber. You know, you've got the accelerator in the wrong place and the gear lever in the wrong yeah. place. So it's got all the normal things. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's it's funny because it's in many ways so very different to the Triumph that I drive every day. So coming into this and driving it has been so easy. I got told by everybody that the transmission units on these was hell on earth and that changing gear was horrendous. Now we don't have synchro mesh on first or on second, but it hasn't really caused a problem because as you said to me, as long as you pause between changing from first into second, you fare well and you're not having you're not crunching through that box. Yeah, just on the you know, on the road if you're in third and you're going down to second, then just a flip of the throttle. Yeah. And, uh, and then down into second. But, yeah. I'm just blown away by how easy it is to drive, how quickly the spatial awareness has come to me, and how sturdy and precise that steering feels. It doesn't feel like a lot of people try and make you feel like it's a dark heart then drive a Land Rover. But I think anybody can jump in one of these. I mean, for goodness sakes, even the Queen has one. And I mean, I can see why she does. She's got very good taste in cars, actually. Now we're going to charge up here past these logs. Oh! Well, that's nice. Yeah. Just to, well, at, <laughs> she'll just take, you can. She'll just crawl up in a second, quite happily. And I think something we should say to people at home actually is about the thumbs up. So you'll probably see that I'm not driving in a normal position where, and I can show you here because it's a bit flatter. My thumbs are down on the steering wheel. My thumbs are up because. As you said yeah. to me, as if anything happens and you slip and you catch your thumbs in there. Yeah, you can if the end wheel up just hits a pothole and suddenly sears, yeah. you don't want your thumb inside the rim. So yeah, no. either, you can you can put them on the outside, you just don't want to grip the steering wheel with your thumb in and suddenly have the wheel turn in your hands and hurt yeah. your thumb. Well this has been jolly good fun. It's been incredibly easy to drive and they they feel so well built. And you know we were talking about facts earlier and about how those plastic windows are only used in 86s. Another interesting fact that you told me whilst we were pootling along is that that badge on the front that reads Birmingham instead of Solihull is because you said to me that these were being sold abroad and people just didn't know where Solihull was. So really Land Rover are not only famous for all their vehicles but they've also put Solihull on the map. Yeah, and by the time of Series 2, the yeah. Land Rover was so well known that they dropped the Birmingham and they went over to Solihull. Went over to Solihull. Well, it's gate o'clock. It has been such a pleasure taking this vehicle out. Thank you for sharing her and thank you for being brave enough to sit up front and um, guide me through my first green lady experience. Oh, I think you've done brilliantly. Oh, thank you very much. And you know what? For anybody watching at home who thinks, should I buy a Land Rover? I'm going to tell you now. Don't bother spending all your money on a brand new one because the new ones go wrong just as much as the old ones. Buy one that you can go and have lots of fun in and there's lots of clubs, big community. So it's not just a car, it's a lifestyle, isn't it? Oh yeah. yeah. And you know what, it's a jolly fun one because it's easy to drive and I really want one now but I cannot justify it. I do not need one, I've got enough cars. So I think that's it from us today. Thank you, Chris, so much. And thank you also to Fred, who's been sitting in the back seat filming us all the way through the green laning experience and some of the bits off-road. It's been 
jolly good hands. But until next Sunday, when I look at something completely different and uh, Chris gets to enjoy his Land Rover solo, take care and drive safely.